Matthew's sermon text is in Romans 6, um, 1, and it says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Now this is a common kind of reasoning in our day because that because Jesus has died for our sins, we can now sin without consequences. However, there has never been a valid excuse to sin. And even more so now that Christ has come to the earth and given his life so that we may be forgiven, sin is even more inexcusable. When you sin, it's like crucifying the Son of God afresh. Now, God so lovingly gives grace, but there is a point where you can stop being given it. You can't continue in sin and continue receiving from the Lord. We must not take this gift from the Lord for granted. If you sin, you are denying the grace of God. And it is like spitting in the face of the Lord. He sacrificed so much for us. He extended himself so that we might live, so that we can be freed from the bondage of sin. And to return to it is more serious than many people think. <clears throat> the good thing is that God's grace enables us to say no to sin. When we are in the Lord, we are no longer in bondage to our desire to sin. Our flesh has this desire, but the spirit does not. There is power in Christ, and we have been freed from the chains of sin, and we must not turn back to the things that we have already been freed from, especially when the price that was paid was Jesus' blood. Dead things sin, but we have been made alive from the dead. So then, brethren, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. What shall we say then, brethren? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? I'm going to repeat it again. God forbid. God forbid. Uh, and, and moving the apostle to address the believers here in our text with, the, with this question, the Lord is actually providing an answer to the reasoning of flesh. Uh, the apostle Paul does this consistently throughout the epistles. He, he, he asks these questions. He's, he's able to trap with like the, the default reasoning of the flesh to, to provide a fully adequate counterpoint uh, according to the truth. He's actually able to anticipate the reaction of men to these things and to the, to the message of the gospel and to address it in a way that makes it look as ridiculous as it actually is. Something he, he's skilled in that kind of a thing, at casting down these, these strongholds of thought. So he, he asks this question first, what shall we say then? And we notice here that the option to say nothing is not presented here. He's, he's making a point. He's forcing the reader to some, come to some kind of conclusion about these matters. In, in, in the fifth chapter, he's expounded this, and he's declared the love of God in salvation. How when we were yet sinners, the Lord made this provision for us, and he loved us and gave his son for us. And that in, all, in Adam, all are destined to die. All were condemned by one man, but that all will live through one man, Christ Jesus. He's expounded these things, and so now he's, he's coming to this conclusion. What are we going to say about this? What shall we say then? He presses the issue because he wants the believers here that he's writing to in Rome to, um, to recognize the fact that whether or not we speak anything about these matters, we do say something in response to them. Uh, whether it's in our heart and our mind or whether it's evidenced by our actions and the way that we live, everybody lives according to conclusions that they've made in their own mind. And, and so the, the apostle, he asks this initial question to, to kind of ready our minds for the questions he's, he's about to ask. He, he does this again also in Romans 8. He says, what shall we then say to these things? He's, he's like gearing, priming their minds. And it's very important how you answer this question. Yes. And not only when it comes to the particular text and subject that I'm talking about uh, today, but in general, as it concerns Scripture, as it concerns the Word of God as a whole. What do you say in response to these things? Uh, how do you conduct yourself within the context of the revelation of God, of what He has revealed about His person and about His purpose? It's the same kind of question that Peter asked to those he was writing to when he says, Seeing then that all things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be? So it's within the context of what we're talking about here, what, what is your reaction to this? How do you direct your life in light of, of this testimony that God has provided for us? So he begins his, his reasoning with them by asking them this question, Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? 
Now, very, very similar to the, some of the other questions that we've um, considered in this preaching festival, this is a, a rhetorical question. Uh, Paul's not asking because he's looking for a, a, a yes or no answer from them. In fact, he's, he's going to answer his own question in a, in a little bit here. He's presenting this question as a means for these believers to examine their own response to the Amen. truth that he's just spoken of. And, and, and to make it plain, to make it obvious that, that this conclusion that some people have come to is, is a ridiculous conclusion. It's, it's not even reasonable. It doesn't even make any sense. He's going to make this apparent. And apparently, by what he has he already said earlier in the third chapter of Romans, he, he's, he's encountered some people who are of this mindset. Well, he said, and not rather as, as we are slanderously reported, and some say that, that, that we uh, say, let us do evil that good may come. You know, So, so he's, he's, he's kind of familiar with what people have been talking about this. Uh, I never really, I never really made the connection directly back to what he had said in the, the previous chapter until recently here. But I, I really appreciate um, the book of Romans. It's, it's a very calculated, it's like a, a, a layered um, reasoning in his exposition of these matters. It's remarkable. It's, 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 he's like building something. I, I can understand why he said that the, the Lord gave him grace to be a wise master builder. Because you, you can see him doing this in the book of Romans. He, in, the, in the first and second chapter, he, he, he starts this off. The next two chapters begin with a question, if you remember. He said, well, what pertaining to the flesh hath, hath Abraham found, you know? And then in, in the third chapter, he says, well, what profit then is there in the Jews, you know? So he, he, he begins several other chapters with this kind of a, a reasoning, a question. He's like erecting strongholds of thought that, that can't be cast down. So shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Now, one ought to be able to see the apparent error in this statement, even after the first few words. Let's just take the part of grace, about grace, out of there. Shall we continue in sin? That's pretty ridiculous. Anyone with even a modicum of sense would be able to tell you, well, no, that doesn't sound right. That doesn't sound good at all. But uh, they add, add this part, oh, that grace may abound, you know. So the, the, they're trying to make some kind of excuse. They're trying to make a way that, that to, to where we, we can feel good about ourselves, that we're, we're doing all right and justified, but at the same time not really giving anything up. We're still able to gratify our own selves and sin and do what we like, but, but oh, the grace of God covers that. And, and actually, this is a very contemporary question. This is something that is going, I mean, people are re reasoning the same way. Flesh is the same as it was all the way back here. And uh, um, men may not just come out and say this, let's sin that grace may abound. I mean, some actually are saying that. But uh, in their doctrine and the way that they live, this is the conclusion that they've made. And um, actually, I was listening to the radio just the other day, and, and I heard somebody saying something about grace. So I, I turned it up and was listening to him. And he said, the other day I was cleaning the house, and I, I, I lifted up the cushion on the couch, and there was a cheese quesadilla in my couch underneath the cushion. I thought, where did this come from? I don't know where, where this, where, maybe when my son put it under there or something. He said, our lives are kind of like that. You know, we got hidden things that we put the cushion on top of. And we want to hide it from people, but, but we don't have to hide it from God. See, God's big. He can handle all of our things. You may be a mess, but you're God's mess. He can handle you cheese quesadilla and all, you know? So that's what the man said. I mean, it just sounds ridiculous to, 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 to say that, but people are saying this. It's basically what they're saying. Well, let's just sin that grace may abound. You know, we're all sinners, but God, God understands. He understands. So I want to ask this question. What does, it, what does it mean for grace to abound? What does that mean? And what happens when an abundant of, abundance of grace is present? What should we expect there to be when, when, when there's grace? When we talk about grace here today, there are some things that you should associate with grace in your mind. And, and um, primarily, our source is the Scripture. We go to the Scripture and see, uh, just as Brother, Brother Tony said, what saith the Scripture? So, in, in second, I just have a few um, short ex examples here. In 2 Corinthians, he said, And God is able to make all grace abound towards you. So what's going to happen when, when all grace abounds towards you? That ye may always, having sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. So, so, so grace causes us to be sufficient, right? Grace causes us to be able to abound to a good work. 
Does that sound like, like, like sin continuing? It doesn't sound like sin continuing. It, it, it equips us to participate in the kingdom. This is what grace does. In 2 Thessalonians, he says that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and in him according to the grace of our God. So it, it's by the grace of God that we are able to glorify him. Uh, when we think about grace, we ought to be able to associate it with enabling us to please God. That's, that's an example of grace abounding, that you can actually be pleasing to the Lord. That's what we should associate with grace. And uh, another, one more example, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10. Now, he, he could have said this any number of ways, but he chose to say it this way on purpose. But the God of all grace. So what's the God of all grace going to do here? Who's called us unto his eternal glory, after that you've suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. So, so grace is what allows us to enter into this perfecting, establishing process. Mm -hmm. This is a work of grace, Amen. something we should think about, that we are called to God's eternal glory by his grace. So um, just in summary there, grace makes us able to abound toward every good work. It makes us able to glorify and please God. It perfects and it establishes us. So what about that would lead you to the conclusion that more sin means more grace? Uh, in the context of what I've just affirmed, it, it ought to be obvious that, that grace is not just a provision that's granted within the context of a sinful individual. It's not just, it's not just that. And, and this ought to be obvious in the second chapter of Luke. It, it says this about Jesus, that as the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, and he was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Now, there, there's been a lot of men who've used this word, um, primarily defined grace, as God's unmerited favor. And there's actually a, a translation of Scripture where everywhere it says grace, they just inserted that phrase, God's unmerited favor. Uh, I, I would agree that none of us are, are worthy of even the least of the blessings of the Lord. I know that this is the truth, that, but, but the, this phrase, it like exalts an emphasis that, that makes men come to improper conclusions. Um, it, it's true from one perspective that you are unworthy, but yet from another perspective, it's true that you must be worthy. Yeah. The favor of God granted towards you in His grace is not really favor despite your condition, but it is favor to bring you to a place where you're actually in a position for God to look at you favorably. Amen. Amen. Uh, in the Revelation, um, Jesus said this uh, to one of the churches, that thou a few names in Sardis which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. And we're exhorted in 1 Thessalonians that you would walk worthy of God. Amen. Now, Paul hasn't exhorted us to do something that we can't do. There's, a, there's a, actually that aspect of grace, that it, the grace of God makes you worthy to, to inherit the inheritance. Amen. So when we talk about grace abounding, the, the triumph of the grace of God is not saving men from condemnation, but rather it's in the creation of these many sons that will be brought to glory. So it's not seen best in the beginning of the work. It is seen best in the continuance and the culmination of the work which was begun. Amen. And the effect of grace ought to be thought primarily within the context of growth, within, within the context of progress and forward movement, more so than within the context of recovery. Now, I understand that it was by the grace of God that we were saved. But it is true that even more so, it is by the grace of God that we are being saved and that we will be saved. Amen. And initially, we were reconciled to him by his grace. And I praise God that that's the truth, that we were. That we were delivered, we were redeemed and sanctified and, and justified by the grace of God. But brethren, even, even more so, praise God, he's, we're going to be glorified. That's, that's the greatness of the grace. That's, that's grace abounding. It says, and he says this in, in the previous chapter. When we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And so that's, that's the way that the, the grace of God tracks. When we think about the grace of God, this is the way we should think about it. This is what it means for grace to abound. Uh, in, in the fifth chapter of Romans, leading up to our text, he also affirms this, this truth in a different way. And I, I love this phrase. 
But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Much more. We're not, we're not talking about just enough to cover it. Just enough to, to recover those ensnared in sin, just to have to re-deliver them after they decided they wanted to jump back into the pit of iniquity. No, this means that grace is designed to bring us higher than we ever were low. The, and, and, and Christ, God makes you more holy than you ever were sinful. He, you are more accepted and you are more loved and you are more close to God than you ever were alienated and separated from Him. Now, in, in, his, epistle, in his epistle to the Ephesians, Paul expounded um, this much more aspect of this, His grace to them as well. And I just want to read these uh, three verses here because I think this expounds the point very well. He says, But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, he's quickened us together with Christ. And he gives us that little parenthetical statement there. By grace ye are saved. So we, we see the grace of God there in the beginning, in the starting of it. But, but why has he done this? And what is he doing with us now? And has raised us up together and made us sit together in Christ in heavenly places. Why? That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us. The exceeding riches of his grace. That's grace abounding. So God has given you grace that he may give you more grace. He, by His grace, He's placed you in Christ Jesus in a place where you can be a partaker of a greater measure of grace. Grace upon grace. That you may be able to appreciate and fellowship with God in a glorious, rich manifestation of the glory of God in the world to come. Now, this is the design of grace. This is why we've been granted grace in the first place. So, uh, Unless we, were, we are brought to this place... Really, the grace of God will never be able to be seen for what it really is. Yeah. Yes. Amen. That being said, to those who may reason the way in which the apostle is denying in our text, I would say that God does not ever really give us grace in spite of our condition. Even in the initial giving of grace, when you come to Christ, he gives you grace in order that you might be brought to a place where your condition is remedied. So in response to our question regarding the continuance of sin, I would say that if you've not availed yourself of the grace of God that he has given you, you will not get any more. To sin, to continue in sin, is actually to deny the grace that you've been given. To, to, it, it, it's, it is actually possible to frustrate the grace of God. We are warned about this in Scripture, that it's possible to fail of the grace of God. To continue in sin, having been delivered from its clutches, it's, it's along this lines of this iniquity that he talks about, failing of the grace of God. As we submit ourselves to the teaching of the Lord in this matter, the grace actually teaches us to live within the environment of grace. The, the reign of grace in our hearts and minds is a righteous reigning. It's, it, it's within the context of holiness or separation from the world and flesh. In Romans 5, this is the way that he talks about this. He said that we have been have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. When we think about the grace of God, this is like, this is like an environment in which we've been given to stand. Now, grace reigns through righteousness, and it reigns in the context of being accepted in the Beloved. As we continue to stand in this place that we've been granted to stand in, to walk in the Spirit, to continue to travel upon this highway of holiness lifted up by the Lord, God actually teaches us by grace to live in this environment of righteousness. The, the apostle affirms this in, as well in the second chapter of Titus, where he says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us. It has a work within us to teach us yeah. that denying ungodliness and worldliness, we should live soberly. Yeah. Not that we should continue in sin, that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly. So, brethren, in, in response to this, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. We can say God forbid to that. Now, other, other versions of this, God forbid, they read, you know, of course not. May it never be so. Certainly not. This is a denial of everything that the grace of God does and represents. This is like the antithesis of being a partaker of the grace of God, of grace abounding to continue in sin. 
And I, I kind of appreciate the way that the King James renders this. It's, I mean, God forbid is not, uh, uh, as far as what I can see, it's not technically the words that are there in the translation, but it's, it's a good thought. The, 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 it's, it has a spiritually good thought because it touches on another aspect of this. And in, in answering this question, Paul is not really saying, well, we shouldn't do this. As much as he's saying that it's not possible. You can't do this. He, he's expressing his own disagreement with the... With, with um, the flesh and his agreement with the heart of God on this matter. God forbid, or from another advantage point, like God actually won't allow this to happen, for you to continue to be a partaker of grace and continue in sin. So God, God is a merciful God. God is long-suffering. He's not willing that any should perish. But there, there is a time when divine forbearance runs out, as, as unpopular as it is to say that. God will not continue to give grace to an individual who continuously frustrates the grace of God. See, grace is not poured out like indiscriminately. Grace doesn't just rain down upon humanity. There's a fountain open, but you have to come to the Lord to be filled, which means you must stay close to him. He doesn't like roll out a hose to the person who's been watered and started to grow and chose to go live in the desert. There's a fountain. You have to come to the Lord. You have to stay close to Him. He's, he's not going to roll out the carpet for you and bring you. Paul said, For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. It doesn't even make any sense. I do not frustrate the grace of God. So where there exists a continual rejection and denial of the work of grace within a person, it's only a matter of time before there's, there's no grace for them. And, and, and really, as grievous as that is for a person to, to come into that condition, I, I'm glad that this is the case. Because, brethren, if the grace of God could abound within an individual who is continually enslaved to sin, then the, the grace of God wouldn't be great at all, would it? That wouldn't be a, a great, great grace. I, I wanted to say something about this, this next verse as well, because it's like a continuation of the thought. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? This is another, another rhetorical question. The, the, the apostle's not asking them this question because he wants to know how to continue to sin. He, he was trying to get them to, again, to reason this out within themselves. He calls them to think about the context, themselves within the context of who they are in Christ Jesus. He appeals to them on that, on that matter. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And I appreciate the simplicity of this, this reasoning. Even a child knows this, that um, when you're dead to something, what's all involved in that? Can a dead person walk? Can a dead person talk? Do dead people eat? Do dead people see things and hear things and talk? No, they don't. A dead person is wholly unresponsive to the environment around them. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't listen. They don't have any kind of fellowship. You can't have fellowship with a dead person. They're just there. And when we think of being dead to sin and dead to the world, this is the way that we ought to think about it in this matter. Yeah, yeah. We're, we are not responsive to the world in that manner. We don't have conversations with the world. We don't listen to what the world listens to. We don't enjoy what the world enjoys. We don't partake of what the world lays out for us. We're just... We're just kind of there for the time being. And th this question brought to my mind the reality of the situation and when we, in which we find ourselves. When we talk about the death of Christ and what it accomplished on our behalf and our own personal apprehension of these things, it involves not only a participation in the benefits, but it also involves a participation in the death as well. There's a very real separation that has to take place here. I don't think that's what's, what's a lot of what's lacking in teaching and preaching in our day. The, the connection between the provision that's been made and our, our apprehension of it. The, the provision of Jesus is, is not simply that Jesus accomplished something for us and now he's giving it to us. Which, which is true. That's, that's true. But he himself is our salvation. That's, that's the thing. His accomplishment of it and the putting away of sin was in order for us to be one with him. For us to be able to apprehend this and become a part of this, it, it will cost you something. One must die with Jesus to be raised with him. There's a death that has to happen. 
And when we talk about salvation being the free gift, we don't mean that it doesn't cost you anything. We mean that God has given you what you could have never paid for. Yes. You, you don't, you'll really only have so much capacity to hold things in your spirit, so to speak. Um, and if you're going to receive this free gift, you're gonna ha if you're going to lay hold on eternal life, you must let go of something else. It, it, it's not going to cost you in the sense of having to purchase it because you, you, you couldn't ever give anything that would be an adequate payment. I understand. We, we have to buy and, we buy and sell the truth. There's something that we give up to be able to, to be a part of Christ, but it's, it's not like we are paying for it. We're not purchasing it in that sense. Um, it, it will, uh, what I'm saying is it will cost you what you're currently holding on to in order to obtain the gift. You can't hold on to these two things at the same time. You only have so much capacity in your spirit to hold on to something. And you can't take that gift unless you've given up what you're, what you're, what you're grasping. And similar to what we just spoke about, being in this arena of grace, the grace wherein we stand, we live and move and have our being in God through Christ Jesus. For us to partake of these things, we, we must die with Christ. We must actually leave one place and go to another. There's a, a translation that takes place. A, a vac to vacate one region of spiritual existence and enter into a new one, into a new heart and a new spirit. So really, in summation of these things that we've been speaking about today, the only way that we may continue in sin and live... As, any longer in it is if we reject and we refuse the grace of God. If we actually resurrect our fleshly and carnal desires again, if we crucify ourselves unto the Son of God afresh and like the dog turn back unto our own vomit, that's the only way that the only way that this will take place. So let me ask you, brethren, does that sound good? Does it sound like there's something to be had there? Like this is something that we want to do? I, there's, there's not any glory in that, brethren. I don't know about you, but I would rather die with Christ that I might forever live with him. I would rather abstain from fleshly lusts that war against the soul that I might let the grace of God abound in me, that I might have participation in the great and glorious day when God reveals to his sons the exceeding richness of his grace. I want to be a partaker of that, of that, of that exceeding grace. So, brethren... In closing, what shall we say to these things? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. So I say, let us continue in Christ that grace may abound. Glory to God. Let us that are alive unto God live forevermore in Christ. Amen.